Hey everyone and welcome back. If you've seen my videos before, you may know that my import mini lathe is a really capable machine. Not only is it able to turn ferrous metals, but it can also make some really great parts. I've used it almost daily for two and a half years and it's still going really well. However, to get to this point, I did need to make some modifications to the lathe. So in this video, I thought I'd show you all the upgrades I've done over the past two and a half years. Some of these upgrades I've done here on the channel and I'll link those videos below in the description and others I'll be showing here for the first time. So the first thing I'd recommend is bolting the lathe down to a workbench. The first benefit is you do gain a bit of rigidity doing this and you certainly will notice it when turning parts. You'll also see an improvement in the surface finish. I'd also encourage bolting your lathe down to a bench because having a 50 kilo machine that can easily move around is a huge safety issue. So all you have to do is drill four holes in your workbench and use the four threaded holes on your lathe to securely fasten it. It's super easy to do, all you need are some M8 bolts. The second upgrade I'd recommend is getting a quick change tool post. These lathes typically come with a 4-way tool post, which limits you to using tools that are 8mm or less in height. A quick change tool post allows you to use bigger size tools and also allows you to quickly change your tools in a matter of seconds. You won't necessarily get better parts, but from an ease of use perspective, they are certainly worth it. Now there are a lot of different models out there to choose from. Originally I bought an aluminium one for $30. A lot of people don't like them, but this one worked just fine for me for over a year and a half, and I only stopped using it when I struggled to machine steel with it. The more popular models tend to be made from steel, and they use a sliding dovetail mechanism to lock the tool holder, but they tend to be a lot more expensive. Alternatively, you can make one in-house. I made one using only the lathe and about $10 worth of aluminium, and that worked just fine. I since replaced it with a steel version that I made on the mill using about $6 worth of steel and they work just fine. Either way, it doesn't matter how you get one, a quick change tool post is a worthwhile upgrade for any lathe. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be to get some new hand wheels for the top slide and cross slide. The design seems to vary between brands and models, but the most common ones are a fixed one piece handle which is very uncomfortable to use. Now everyone has their own design, and I kept mine simple. I turned down a 20mm thick piece of acrylic. I then turned down a handle and drilled the centre out and added a taper to it. The handle is then bolted to the hand wheel and a nut prevents the bolt from unscrewing. It's a really simple design but it works really well. I've seen people add bushings to this handle but I've kept it really simple and the wear is really minimal. There are many different designs that work. I also replaced the top slide handle. It's the same design but I added a small brass standoff that helps stabilise the power feed. And the power feed is just a recycled chuck key that I've put in a cordless drill. Overall, this is an essential mod. It's super quick and easy to do, and it will make using the lathe so much more enjoyable. Upgrade number four would be a carriage lock. This is a very useful mod when you need to face large diameter stock, and you need to get a constant depth of cut and a good finish. Without one, the carriage tends to be pushed back when turning, and you tend to get a very inconsistent cut. Now adding one is very simple. You get some bar stock of steel, and cut it and file it down so it fits in the gap in the carriage. You then bolt that piece of metal to the carriage. A piece of metal is then made that can fit between the ways. You can use a mill for this, or you can use a file. When that is done, you add a hex headed screw and you tighten it when you need to lock the carriage. The resulting carriage lock gives you much better cuts, and it allows you to make precise cuts using the top slider. Overall, it's a great addition. I used a drill press for this, but I've seen people do it with just a cordless drill. 
For a full breakdown, there's a link in the description to my video on it. The next upgrade I'd recommend are slide locks. They lock the slide in place, adding rigidity, and prevent backlash, pushing the tool away from the part. Adding them is really simple. I drilled a hole in between the grub screws, and I tapped the hole for M5. I then got some M5 hex headed screws and screwed them in. When I need to lock the slide in place, I tighten the screw and it pushes up against the gib, locking it in place. I did this for both the top slide and cross slide. Overall, it's a very quick and effective mod. I used my mill to do it, but I think you could easily do it with a drill press. Upgrade number 6 would be to change the carriage retainer strips. They have a very critical role in keeping the carriage on the lathe, and the factory design does a very poor job of this. They use an odd adjusting mechanism, using grub screws to set the height, and this is very difficult to adjust properly, and if they aren't properly adjusted, the carriage can easily lift up when turning parts. Another issue is that the strips are made from cast iron, and can easily crack and split in half. I made a replacement on the mill. A slot was cut on one side, and the strips were shimmed to the correct height. They need to be up, pressed against the underside of the ways, but not so tight that the carriage can't move. And the difference in cutting performance was really noticeable and 100% worth it. The only downside is, for this mod, you do need a mill or a router to cut the slot, which may prevent a lot of people from being able to do it. However, if you have a mill, I really encourage you to do this. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be to add a solid tool post. All that you need to do is replace the compound with a solid piece of metal that is the same height as the compound. This is done because you lose a lot of rigidity with the compound, and since I don't cut tapers all that often, I was very happy to remove it. I made mine using the mill, but you could easily do it on the lathe and drill press. For about $4 worth of aluminium or steel, it makes a really big difference in cutting ability, and on a mini lathe, you need all the rigidity that you can get. Overall, it's certainly worthwhile, especially if you don't use the compound all that often. Improvement number 8 would be to get a new chuck. This lathe came with a 3 jaw 80mm scroll chuck, and I happily used it for over 8 months before upgrading. It worked just fine, but the jaws are really poorly machined and it's very crunchy to use. Thankfully 80mm chucks are really inexpensive. I bought a 4 jaw scroll chuck for about $70 and the difference is just night and day. The action is so much smoother and the run out is about 50% better at around 50 or so microns. Overall it's not an essential upgrade, but I certainly recommend it. I also picked up an independent 4-jaw chuck. It's really good for getting low run out, but I rarely use it, mainly because of the time it takes to dial in a part. And 50 microns of run out is pretty acceptable for most of the stuff that I do. Upgrade number 9 will be to get a new motor, and it's a very common upgrade to do. Depending on the exact model and brand, the motors typically come either brushed or brushless, and they're between 350 and 700 watts. My lathe, for example, came with a brushed 350 watt motor, and it was very underpowered, and had a very unreliable controller which blew. And that's a very common issue with these lathes. Now I've seen people fit treadmill motors and sewing machine motors, but I went for a drill press motor. The drill press motor runs on AC power, so it is fixed speed, so I use pulleys to step up and down the RPM. But because the motor has very little electronics, very little can go wrong with it. The motor also delivers a lot of torque, even though it's only rated for about half a horsepower. There are many different ways of doing this upgrade. All of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, but they are all certainly worthwhile because it allows you to take much heavier cuts in materials. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be to change the spindle bearings. From the factory, these lathes use plain ball bearings, which do not cope well with the axial forces generated by turning. Now, I used the stock bearings for two years, and by the end, it was clear that they were wearing out. There was increased chatter by the end, so I had to reduce my depth of cut.
I replaced the bearings with 3206 taper roller bearings, although you can also use 7206 angular contact bearings. To replace the bearings, you will need to take the headstock apart, and a press and bearing puller will be really useful here, but you can easily do it with a vise, a hammer, and some pieces of wood. I've linked a full breakdown in the description. The new bearings were a huge improvement, as they reduce the amount of chatter I get from turning, and as a result I can take much deeper cuts in steel. Now every few months I will need to re-grease them, but the improvement certainly makes up for them. At $20 per bearing, it certainly is a worthwhile upgrade. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be to get new gib strips. A very common problem is they are bent from the factory, and they have a very poor surface finish. This prevents you from properly adjusting the gibs, resulting in the slides lifting under load. You can buy replacements made from brass for about $30, or you can make them, if you have a mill, for about a third of the cost. Now technically you should be making them from a bearing bronze, but in a pinch, brass works just fine for this application. And considering that bearing bronze is a lot harder to find in my part of the world, and a lot more expensive, I'll be sticking with the brass ones for the moment. The brass ones do a fantastic job. It's much smoother than before, and I can probably adjust the gibs, resulting in a much more rigid setup. It certainly is a worthwhile upgrade. A more recent upgrade that I've done is to add a lever locking mechanism to the tailstock. A lot of mini lathes nowadays have them as standard, but a lot of Sieg branded ones still come with a nut locking mechanism. It's really cumbersome to use, and it takes substantially longer to lock and unlock the tailstock compared to the lever action. Furthermore, the standard nut that it comes with is so thin that it has a tendency to strip the threads on the locking stud. Now I have a full breakdown of the upgrade linked below. The only downside of my upgrade is you do need a mill to do it, so I've also linked some examples that don't require a mill. Overall, it's a worthwhile upgrade, especially if you need to use the tailstock a lot. It's not a quick upgrade, it does require the use of a mill, but it is certainly worthwhile. Another upgrade that I did to the tailstock was some rudimentary scraping. I added some alcohol marker on the ways, and it shows very little contact between the ways and the tailstock base. It's a bit crude, but I used a scalpel to remove the high spots to allow more of the tailstock to make contact with the wags. Now one day I'd like to do proper scraping with a proper surface plate, but until then I'll take small improvements where I can. Overall, it's a really quick mod, but I can certainly feel an improvement when moving the tailstock on the wags. Upgrade number 14 is to add a cover to the gear train in the apron. It's exposed and it faces the workpiece, and chips and dust can easily gum up the gears. The solution is pretty simple. I trace the shape of the apron onto a piece of paper. I then cut the paper template out and use spray adhesive to glue it onto some 1mm sheet steel. I form the sheet steel into the right shape by hand using some tin snips and some files. It was then clamped and several holes drilled and tapped to bolt the cover to the apron. With that done, it was reassembled and since then I've had zero issues with chips getting caught in the gear train. It's a really simple and effective mod and I really recommend it. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be to add some oiler ports to help you add oil into hard to access parts on your lathe. I recommend buying button oilers, but I integrated my oilers into existing holes that I have made for other lathe attachments. The holes allow me to use an oiler to add new oil into the slides. In the future, when I buy some button oilers, I will be adding one into the tailstock. If you use the lead screw a lot, I'd also recommend oiler ports in the bushings. However, since I rarely use the lead screw, I'm in no rush to add them. I also used the factory carriage lock port for oiling. The cross slide nut hole can also be used to add oil to the cross slide nut. The next upgrade I'd recommend would be a fix for the top slider. If you've used the top slide before, you might notice that the dial jams when you turn the dial in a clockwise direction. 
This occurs because the flange on the lead screw is constrained on only one side. So when you turn the lead screw clockwise, the spacer pushes up against the dial and jams it. To add a constraint on the other side, I'll use this piece of 20mm bar stock. I filed it to fit within the dovetail and I marked the centre of where the lead screw was. I then drilled a 10mm hole and opened it up using a round file. I then drilled a hole and tapped it for M5. The bolt was able to hold the metal so well that I cut away the excess on the other side, enough so the gib could be inserted. With the constraint added, the lead screw should be able to spin freely but should have minimal forwards and backwards movement. Finally, I swapped the spacer for a much smaller one so it wouldn't push up against the dial. And the upgrade worked really well. I did lose about 18mm of travel in the top slide, and I know there are certainly more compact designs out there, but since I rarely use the top slide, this simple and quick fix really suited me. One day I might revisit it, but for the moment, this design works just fine. The next upgrade is pretty simple. It's a spring underneath the tailstock. It keeps the locking stud locked down, so when you move it around, it doesn't get caught. It's really simple, but it makes a huge difference. Upgrade number 18 is to level your tailstock. From the factory, the tailstock tends to be angled slightly down. The result is especially noticeable when you use long twist drills. The drill will seem to lift up when you're drilling. The fix is really simple. Get some shim stock and shim underneath the tailstock. It's a really easy fix and it will bring the tool post parallel with the centre of the spindle. Upgrade number 19 was a complete remake of the cross slider. This was a really big project, but the increase in rigidity due to using a higher tensile material and increase in mass at least compared to the cast iron cross slide and the addition of T-slots makes this my favourite upgrade. You do need a mill and several specialised cutters, but you only need about $10 worth of raw stock. I'll link the build video below, and I think it's certainly worth checking it out. Upgrade number 20 is a little bit controversial, and that is lapping the slides. The finish from the factory of the sliding surfaces was pretty poor, so I used some compound to lap the surface. I wasn't aiming for a mirror finish, but I did notice some improvement in the slides. Since then, I've gone back and done some rough scraping, similar to what I showed before. The scraped surface should better allow for oil to lubricate the surfaces, though one day I would really like to go back and use a surface plate and some proper scrapers to finish the job. Overall, it wasn't a quick process, but I certainly noticed a big improvement. And there we have it. These are all the mods that I've done over the past two and a half years. And I still have a few more to do, but I've done most of the major ones. And I really couldn't be happier with the outcome. Realistically speaking, this is the largest lathe I can fit in my workshop, and I'm really happy with the parts that it can produce. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you have any other suggestions, I'd really like to hear from you. I hope you learned something and maybe take something away from this video, maybe to put on your own lathe. And with that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one.